ride onward to the fray. Salvation's helmet on each head with truth all girt about. The earth shall tremble neath our tread and echo with our shout. Amen! Faith is a victory. Faith is a victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. To him that overcomes the foe, white raiment shall begin. Before the angels he shall know his name confessed in heaven. Then onward from the hills of life, our hearts with love aflame, will vanquish all the hosts of night. In Jesus Christ. Because of that name, all knees shall bow, and yes, we get Lord. the victory. Please stand. Please stand. Let's sing about that name a little more. 231. Yeah. 231. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Amen. That's where we went out before we came to Sunday morning service, right? Yes. We're going door to door, yep. and when the neighbor answered the door, we just gave them that question. Jesus saves, yes. Jesus saves. All right, 231, here we go. We have heard the joyful sound, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Spread the tidings all around, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Bear the news to every land, glide the steeps and cross the waves. Onward to his, our Lord's command. salvation through your son the Lord yeah, Jesus Lord, Christ yes. thank you for that perfect sinless blood that you shed on the on the cross at Calvary for each and every sinner that will just simply humbly come to the cross and accept that free gift Lord yes. I pray father God that you would uh, put a hedge around this room and that you would protect everyone in it and that you would protect the service from any attacks from the world the flesh of the devil I pray that you would have the Holy Spirit to have free course in this room today, yes. Father God, that you would fill Pastor with Holy Ghost unction, give him boldness to preach the truth, how you want it preached, and don't worry about hurting our feelings, Lord, because we need it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 You may be seated. You may be seated. White hymnal. All right, my, our favorite, right? Without the white hymnal, you know, we probably wouldn't exist right here. All right, the white hymnal. Let's sing, Tis Marvelous and Wonderful, to 28, please, 28. Doing the greatest hits today. Amen. Amen. Oh, thank God, it's always marvelous That's and right. it's always wonderful. Yes, sir. 
All right then, so unfortunately, even though this song is marvelous and wonderful, we have to cut off one verse. So we're going to cut off uh, verse 2, all right, for time's sake. Verse 2 for time's sake. Here we go. The Savior has come in his mighty power and spoken peace to my soul. And all of my life from that very hour, I yielded to his control. I yielded to his control. Oh, it is wonderful, it is marvelous and wonderful what Jesus has done for this soul of mine. The half has never been told. Oh, it is wonderful, it is marvelous and wonderful what Jesus has done for this soul. Jesus has done for this soul of mine, the half has never been told. That's right. Oh, it is wonderful, it is marvelous and wonderful what Jesus has done for this soul. Jesus has done for this soul of mine, the half has never been told. Oh, it is wonderful, it is marvelous and wonderful what Jesus has done for this soul of mine. Until we go to heaven, then we'll see it all. Amen. All right, then, if Brother Tom can come forward and give the announcements for us, please. Sir. Well, hello. Nice to see all your brethren here today. Good morning. Praise God. All right. We have some exciting events for this upcoming week, if you guys have heard. So one thing before we go on, on Monday, which is tomorrow, Pastor wanted to know whether or not you guys wanted to have Bible study and the reason why this time he's asking is because originally we we're going to cancel it because we we're going to have a lot of events from fr uh, from uh, Saturday onward so we didn't want you guys to be too tired but if you guys want to have discipleship and Bible study today it's still open please let pastor know and it'll be discipleship at 7 p.m. Bible study at 8 p.m. and just contact pastor and he'll be there um, our memory verses are going to be Psalms 119 9 and 11 um, 119, 9, and 11. I actually memorized this on my own because this was something that I was, this was part of something I was doing personally, but 119, 9 is going to be, wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to, to thy word. And that's a very important verse, I think, because, see, us young people, we, we fall into temptations and we're young, so we kept, we keep getting dogged on by the world, but you know what? This is what the Lord says. We have to cleanse his way by taking heed according to his word, right? So that's important. Verse 11 is even better. Thy word have I hid in my heart, mine heart that I might not sit against thee. So this you can keep in your, your own heart and mind so that when you feel like you're going to fall in, into some wicked temptation or something, you can be like, well, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. So I think these are very awesome verses. Pastor's right. This book is full of very, very good verses. So... 
let's see how many we can memorize by the end of this month. Um, so this Sunday, again, this Sunday, we're going to remember, we're going to have fellowship this Saturday with our missionary, um, I think Mr. Nate Hansen, Brother Turner, who is who was pastor's um, Bible teacher in Pensacola. He's going to be coming and teaching on Saturday, 7 p.m. It's going to be downstairs here in this building. Um, so it's and it's a potluck. So make sure you guys bring your own food. He's going to be teaching. Okay, he's going to be teaching for us. So please, if you can, if you can make it, please make it on time. I know some some of you have work schedules, and I know we can't like exactly come at seven, but and that's okay. But if you have the time available, please come earlier on time so that you know he can speak on time, and we can have great you know fellowship and eating and all that stuff. Um, so another big news: Missionary Huggins, who happens to be Dr. Ruckman's stepson, is also going to be coming on August 19th. He's going to be drawing like the late Dr. Ruckman himself. It's going to be great. So please come. It's going to be awesome. I'm sure I've wanted to see a live chalk talk, but I never, I was never able to because Dr. Ruckman unfortunately went home before I could, but you might, you guys might get a taste of what it's like on that day. And uh, pastor, please come and do what you must. All right. So we don't have uh, time to sing special today. So we're going to take up the Lord's offering. All right, and if you can start off the service with a word of prayer, Brother Robert. Jeremiah chapter 41, please. Jeremiah chapter 41. Wow, it's so good to see uh, our members, right? You know, a lot of them went through some, you know, sicknesses, hardships, some things happening, but thank God that they're here, amen? Thank God also for the new visitors that were able to come today, and uh, let's try to be a blessing to everybody here. All right, Jeremiah chapter 41, please. Jeremiah 41. Maybe the Lord has a funny sense of timing. I just don't know. But then uh, with everybody back, this just happens to be one of the, maybe maybe one of the hardest sermons. I don't know. So, yeah, that's right. So sometimes, sometimes the Lord, he has his reasons, right? Sometimes the Lord has his reasons. Okay, Jeremiah chapter 41, please. And we will read verse 1. Now it came to pass in the seventh month that Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, the son of Elishama, of the seed royal, and the princes of the king, even ten men with him, came unto Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, to Mizpah, and there they did eat bread together in Mizpah. Then arose Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, and the ten men that were with him, and smote Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, with the sword, and slew him, whom the king of Babylon had made governor over the land. Ishmael also slew all the Jews that were with him, even with Gadaliah, and Mizpah, and the Chaldeans that were found there, and the men of war. And it came to pass the second day after he had slain Gadaliah, and no man knew it, that there came certain from Shechem, from Shiloh, and from Samaria, even fourscore men, having their beards shaven and their clothes rent, and having cut themselves with offerings and incense in their hand to bring them to the house of the Lord. And Ishmael, the son of Nathaniah, went forth from Mizpah to meet them, weeping all along as, excuse me, as he went. And it came to pass as he met them, he said unto them, Come to Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam. And it was so when they came into the midst of the city, that Ishmael, the son of Nathaniah, slew them and cast them into the midst of the pit, he and the men that were with him. But ten men were found among them that said unto Ishmael, Slay us not. For we have treasures in the field of wheat, and of barley, and of oil, and of honey. So he forbear, and slew them not among their brethren. Now the pit wherein Ishmael had cast all the dead bodies of the men whom he had slain because of Gedaliah 
was it which Asa the king had made for fear of Baasha king of Israel. And Ishmael the son of Nathaniah filled it with them that were slain. Then Ishmael carried away captive all the residue of the people that were in Mizpah, even the king's daughters, and all the people that remained in Mizpah, whom Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, had committed to Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam. And Ishmael, the son of Nathaniah, carried them away captive and departed to go over to the Ammonites. So in this long passage that we read, I realize there's a lot of rich, rich things that we can learn from. And actually, you'll notice that the key element that I'm going to be focusing on is a filthy ditch, a filthy ditch. In this filthy ditch that King Asa made, now, if you've read your Bible, King Asa is a good king. But I don't know how much you remember because there was just so many things happening in these 10 verses. So we're going to be examining all these verses. But to recall your memory and what we read, King Asa, when he was battling with King Baasha, he built this ditch. Why? Because he was afraid of the king. Rather than trusting in God, he was afraid of King Baasha. And through this building of the filthy ditch, it became not uh, his, only his own burden of sin to carry, it actually burdened others as well. Why? It became a ditch where his own people where King Asa's fellow countrymen were buried. They were killed. They were murdered. The ditch which he thought would have been his aid actually became the grave instead of murdered victims. Asa had no idea this would happen years later, just like some Christians who failed to see that their filthy ditch wouldn't just burden them, but it's going to burden others as well. If there is a hard sermon that's going to be preached, it's against sin. It's against sin. Whenever sin is preached, that becomes one of the most negative sermons ever. And I did not plan to preach on it if I knew which kind of people would come. But you see, that's what God does. God deliberately, he wants, to, he wants Gene Kim out of the way, and he wants to be in the way, and then God's the one who will bring the right people for the right message too. So I pray that uh, this was not planned. So I hope that this sermon will be a blessing to you. The title of my message today is Stop Being a Filthy Ditch. Let's pray. God, my Father, please wash away my sins with your precious and most holy blood. God, my Father, I'm going to preach a hard sermon against sin. And I pray that each and every one of us will be under conviction. I know that I am under conviction when I prepared this message. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that my life and other people's lives here, that we won't be a filthy ditch where it's going to hurt others around us and we can even hurt ourselves because sin does not play fair. Sin does not know love. Sin does not know compassion. Sin is merciless and it brings terrible consequences. I pray that you'll fill within me the power of your Holy Spirit and dear Lord God, hide me behind the cross of Jesus Christ and I pray Heavenly Father that as your blood washes away my sins and that I'm filled with the Spirit, you'll take full control and that the preaching will be a blessing to the hearers. But most of all, please you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right, my first point is the commencement of filth. The commencement of filth. Look at verse 1. Now it came to pass in the seventh month that Ishmael, the son of Nathaniah, the son of Elishama, of the seed royal, and the princes of the king, even ten men with him, came unto Gadaliah the son of Ahai, come to Mizpah, and there they did eat bread together in Mizpah. How this slaughter happened was when Ishmael first commenced it. The destruction of the filthy ditch, it wouldn't have occurred had it not been commenced, started, noticed by one man, Ishmael. It was only by one man, Ishmael. And you got to realize that's all it takes to have a filthy ditch. It only takes one to start it. Now, did you realize what I just said? That's how bad sin is. It only takes one to start the virus, to start the spread. Psalms chapter 7 and verse 15, it says, He made a pit and digged it and digged it and is fallen and is fallen into the ditch which he made. You start being a filthy ditch to the church through skipping 
Every meeting not volunteering to help out others, the lack of socializing and being a blessing to people, being a burden with your own character, whining, starting fights, causing disunity through doctrines and different convictions, diminishing the power of the Holy Spirit where you don't, where you don't feel convicted to be able to repent, to come on the altar if the Lord led upon your heart to do so, uh, why subtract the shouting? Why subtract the singing? Why subtract the joyful atmosphere? Why create the deadness? Why not come to the altar calls? It starts one where it affects others. And you got to realize that that kind of dead atmosphere, the sinful atmosphere, and everything else, even the sins that you're hiding, it unconsciously affects others around you, you got to understand. It affects people around you. It takes one to start it. It takes one to start it. You know how San Jose Bible Baptist Church can close down? All I have to do is that if even people online, it doesn't matter how many thousands, it doesn't matter how many scores of people have been through our church, all it takes is one time they see Pastor Gene Kim uh, committing fornication, one time. Stealing money, one time. Uh, compromising and preaching false prophecy one time. That's all it takes to ruin everything and close down a Bible-believing ministry. Right. And you got to realize it's just one thing that can commence and start. See, you got to realize is well, I just only skipped a few church services. Well, you know, it's a secret sin, you know. Well, it's, uh, it's not as major like I'm stuck it with marijuana or doing drugs, you know. It's just a, hey, you got to realize this, it starts. Sin always starts, and that's where it affects everything and grow. The ditch and the sin would not exist if you didn't start it, no matter how little it is. See, it wouldn't have existed. It wouldn't not have existed. It would not have uh, spread out. It would not have had any influence on anybody, including you, if you didn't even start the little tidbit of it. My second point is the congregation of filth. The congregating of filth. Look at verses 1 through 2. We read verse 1. Ishmael started it and he congregated people around him. You'll notice. Verse 2, you'll notice that Ishmael and 10 men were with him. You'll notice that. There were 10 men who joined him. Then you'll look at verse 7 and you'll notice that in verse 7, Ishmael, when he killed these people, when he committed the wrong action with a filthy ditch, he didn't do it all by himself. He had 10 men with him helping him out on that. And you got to realize this, that filth congregates. It attracts people around you. You think that you're the only one? No, it, it attracts, it congregates people around you. See, Ishmael was not the only filthy ditch here. There were 10 men who congregated with him. And the lesson that you must learn is that you'll make others congregate and join you and accompany accompany you in being a filthy ditch too, not just you. You got to realize that uh, whether it be lack of prayer, whether it be skipping Bible reading, whether it be putting something in your mouth where you shouldn't have, uh, whether it be bitterness, whether it be anger, whether it be discouragement, it doesn't matter what your ditch is, what the sin is. You got to realize that other people will congregate around you. Sin always attracts people around them. Don't you know that? But look, you think the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was black and ugly and disgusting and smelly to eat? Or was, did it attract congregate people? See, it wasn't just Eve. She got Adam to join her. And if God didn't kick them out, how many people would have eaten that more? You got to realize sin congregates and attracts people around them. Matthew chapter 15 and verse 14, it reads, Let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, what, is it just one guy? No, both shall fall into the ditch. You build the ditch. You're not the only one who will fall in there. Other people will join you. Blind lead the blind. Both shall fall into a ditch. You must understand that when you become a ditch to the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, it's not that you just discourage them to serve God. See, you think that uh, skipping soul winning 
is going to discourage your brother and sister in Christ from coming to soul winning? No, that's not the only thing. It's not the, uh, you think it's also going to discourage the pastor from skipping soul winning? No, that's not the only thing. It's not just, just discouraging. You encourage them to skip soul winning too. You encourage them to become dead like you. You encourage them to sin like you. You encourage them to diminish their spiritual walk with Jesus Christ and their efforts like you. Because you know why? Uh, it, as, I, as I look around our world and see so many different people around me, we are so built by going with the flow of people. That's how people are. You got to realize that. I mean, teens, what do they do when they go to school? They go with the flow of their classmates. That's why they will talk like them. Uh, they will have the same hobbies like them. They will love the same things like them. Uh, they will dress like them. They will hang around the same people that they're, those people are hanging around with. They will go to the same places those people are going towards. Why? Because that's how people are. People go with the flow. And you got to realize this, that when you build a filthy ditch, you're going to have people around you. You will attract people around you. Do you want to be, you think that your sin problem is your own undoing, your own judgment, your own consequence? No, you encourage people around you to fall into the ditch with you. There's nothing more guilty. There's nothing more convicting. There's nothing that will bring you greater discouragement and great distress by not just paying your own sin, but that you are the cause of so many people who joined with you in the ditch. My third point is the contempt of filth. The contempt of filth. Look at verse 3. Verse 3. You'll notice right here, Ishmael also slew all the Jews that were with him. Now look at that. He slew everybody that he was around. Man, what a bad contempt. His testimony, his reputation, what contempt. Now look at verse 18. Verse 18. Because of the Chaldeans, for they were afraid of them. Because Ishmael, the son of Nathaniah, had slain Gadaliah, the son of Ahikam, whom the king of Babylon uh, made governor in the land. Now look at this. You'll notice right here, that certain of the Jews at verse 18 were scared of the Chaldeans. Why? Because of that contempt that Ishmael already spread out with his testimony. Look, it only takes like a, a big terrorist name that you will hear on the news like Osama bin Laden. That kind of contempt that already everybody will hear about. And it will affect people around them. See, you got to understand this is that... Like how Ishmael's contempt shamed the testimony of his people Israel to the unsaved Chaldeans, a Christian who's a filthy ditch will shame the testimony of his own people too to the unsaved world. Do you think that the ditch you're di digging up is shaming your own testimony? No, it shames the whole church. You got to realize it shames your brother and sister in Christ. It shames your pastor. And it does not matter how much they love Jesus. It does not matter how much efforts or works and fruits we make up for it. You got to realize that when the ditch is built, they will connect you to that ditch, especially since we live in a day and age where news media are hunting down Christians to find out a negative thing and they'll connect it to that whole church and that whole congregation and the pastor. You got to watch your testimony. You got to watch your filth. Psalms chapter 88, verse 4 and verse 8. It says, I am counted with them that go down into the pit. See, when a pit and a ditch is all made up, you got to realize that you're counted with them. I am as a man that hath no strength. Thou hast put away mine acquaintance far from me. Thou hast made me an abomination unto them. I am shut up and I cannot come forth. Look at that. What contempt that he's shut up. That he can't boast his uh, fruits and his clean testimony to the whole world. So you got to ask yourself, you got to ask yourself these questions. I don't think people see their contempt. So let me go through a little bit of specifics right here. Don't you feel ashamed? When you bring a newcomer to church and there's hardly anybody around? Don't you feel ashamed when you testify how many your church has led to salvation? We led hundreds to salvation, but not many of them came to church. Don't you feel ashamed when you testify how God uses your church and then they find instead a lot of problems in the church when they come? 
Don't you feel ashamed when you want to show how God used your church in your location and area to encourage other people around you that when a guest speaker comes and they say, man, I've heard great things about your church, and they come and they don't see that firsthand? Don't you feel ashamed when others testify how mightily God has used their church, but you, feel, but you feel embarrassed to show what's going on in your church? Don't you feel ashamed when we call ourselves, when we call ourselves King James only, Bible-believing, dispensational, that stand for the whole truth and nothing for the truth, and that we sow in and that we don't compromise and we're not a dead church and that we live on for God, but when others come, they don't see that? See, contempt, when you build a ditch, that's what others will see. How can we not see the contempt and the shame of the testimony? It doesn't matter, you know, what kind of fruits and the efforts that we pulled and that they're real and that they happen. When people see it firsthand, they're going to see it differently. And you don't want to bring a bad testimony and embarrassment and shame to your brothers and sisters in Christ, to your own home church where God has given to you, to your own family. My fourth point, the carnage of filth. The carnage of filth. Look at verse 5. Look at verse 5. And verse 9, verse 5 and verse 9. You'll notice right here that there came certain from Shechem, from Shiloh, and from Samaria, even fourscore men, 80 men, having their beards shaven and their clothes rent. Wow, that's bad. And having cut themselves with offerings and incense in their hand to bring them to the house of the Lord. Wow. Look at verse 9. Now the pit wherein Ishmael had cast all the dead bodies of the men whom he had slain because of Gedaliah, was it which Asa the king had made for fear of Baasha, king of Israel? And Ishmael, the son of Nathaniah, filled it with them that were slain. Look at the carnage here. Verse 5, so many people in shame, cutting themselves, cutting their beards. And then you'll find out that at verse 9, all the bodies of the slain. What carnage. What carnage. And you know what? The carnage happened at, at a day when the Jews came to worship God that day. I mean, did you read verse 5? See? Did you read verse 5? Being a filthy ditch will kill in carnage many faithful brethren who served God and came to church that day. Today, Sunday, your ditch is going to affect and hurt other people around you. Don't you know that? When there are people trying to serve God and trying to soul win and they're praying on their knees and they're reading their Bible and they're staying away from sin and they're living for Jesus Christ and they're loving the brethren and they're trying to reach people out there and you are not doing that, you got to realize this is that that's what happens. The carnage happens, the ditch happens in the midst of people serving God. They no longer serve God anymore or their lives have been messed up. Jeremiah 18 20 says, Shall evil be recompensed for good? For they have digged a pit for my soul. Remember that I stood before thee to speak good for them and to turn away thy wrath from them. But it can't be done. Because the carnage is great. Can evil, shall evil be recompensed for good? You know, uh, I know of a church because all my life I've been through many other Bible believing churches. But I know of a particular church that was like the only Bible-believing one in the whole city there. And you know what? They were getting fired up. In fact, they were all getting fired up. There was, in fact, another brother who was moving out of states to move over there and help out the church. But you know what happened? They were all excited, and they were going to get going for the Lord, but there was one member. See, it's always a ditch. It's always a ditch. There was one member who was a, being a filthy ditch. And I see this in so many different churches. So it's like, you know, I'm like, whatever, you know, this is just normal now. So it's not a surprise, and, you'd be, and you wouldn't be surprised too if you'd been here long enough. You wouldn't be surprised. What do you think the member did? Just like other members, they'll whine, they'll cause a fight, they'll bring a depressed spirit, they'll skip church services and then skip soul winning and then using busyness and problems in his or her own life her, his or her own suffering as, a, as an excuse and the busyness to not be able to come now doesn't that feel like that every single person in the room is like ooh that's me right there you know why that's not a surprise I've been through so many churches that's how we feel 
But see, it's just one member that did it. And guess what happened? What happened is because of now that uh, stirring the pot that just happened, it only took one, only took one. That person obviously didn't come back to church. And what happened? What happened now was, is that the pastor was doing all the work by himself. And then the brother who moved out of states didn't come anymore, didn't have a church to go to anymore. <laughs> moved out of states for it. Now that church is gone and he can't do it. And you know what happened? The pastor couldn't take it anymore. And with that pressure, he quit it too. So that city now no longer has a hope of Bible-believing truth. Now that city is back to the darkness where it's at. No soul winner, no street preacher, no one to tell them how to get saved, and no one to show them Bible-believing truth. Why? It took one, one, one being a filthy ditch. One. It only takes one to build a filthy ditch and to destroy. You don't realize the carnage it creates of just one. Man, you were lucky today to come to this really hard sermon, right? Amen. I don't, it just happened to be this one. If I realized who was coming, I wouldn't preach this sermon today. But you see, God knows. And you got to realize this, that's how bad a ditch is. That's how bad sin is. It creates a carnage. You really don't think that just you alone can be the filthy ditch to ruin the whole church? You don't think so? Really? It only took one Judas Iscariot, right? To get all the disciples to flee to crucify the Lord Jesus Christ, close down the three and a half year ministry. And wasn't Jesus Christ the best pastor out of all of us? And we are the weaker pastors. How much more can our own ministries, because we're no more, we're weaker than Jesus, can be ruined even more effectively by one. And I mean one. That's good preaching. My fifth point is the core of filth. The core of filth. Look at verse seven, verse seven. You'll notice right here, and it was so when they came into the, notice, midst of the city. See that? The core. That Ishmael, the son of Nathaniah, slew them and cast them into the midst of the pit, he and the men that were with him. The slaughter, the after effect, the carnage of the filthy ditch was where? At the very midst and heart and core of God's city. Likewise, the slaughter in a filthy ditch, you know where it's going to hurt? At the midst and the core of God's currently working in the church. We're seeing souls saved. The Holy Spirit's mightily moving. We're seeing so many fruits. We're seeing so many people getting baptized. We're seeing so many people coming to church. Man, my sinful life is being cleaned up. Man, I'm seeing more members pumped up and fired up. That's when the slaughter, the filthy ditch happens. It happens at the core and the heart of God's work and ministry. Strike the heart and then all the pieces will fall. Psalms chapter 57 and verse 6, it says, They have prepared a net for my steps. My soul is bowed down. They have digged a pit before me into the midst whereof they are fallen themselves. Selah. So notice that this digging of the pit is where? At the midst. It's at the core. See, you know what Satan always does? He does it at the core and the heart and the center at the right time. He'll do it at the right time, the Amen. right circumstances where he sees it, uh, the right people that are set up, the right all the chess pieces into place, and the right suffering that is built up, uh, the right moment and the tension that is built up, the right moment where the worldliness and the deadness becomes more attractive and where he builds up sin even more. He puts it at the right time, the right moment, where your suffering is great, where your busyness is great, where your persecution from your loved ones and friends and family members is great. He sets it up at the right time, so he'll certainly do it at the very core of God's working in a church. And imagine at the judgment seat of Christ, and God was about to show you, wow, at the very moment where I was going to use you mightily, at the very moment you're going to get more people saved. At the very moment, there was going to be more people coming to church. At the very moment where you're going to get most fruit. At that very moment, I was about to finally answer your prayers that you've been praying for years and use something mightily in your life in the church. Now you just disrupt it by being a filthy ditch. And I couldn't do it anymore. 
It's like the Holy Spirit was filling up in your life with all the prayers and all the sweat and the tears and the labors of the saints and the Holy Spirit was about to burst forth. Then someone, you yourself, built a ditch. And now the Holy Spirit, he can't cut loose now. He strikes at the core and the heart. That's what Satan does. Haven't we seen? Because, you know, if we, since we hung out together, I mean, we're getting testimonies. I mean, Brother Emilio, he was, le I didn't text all of you guys, but he was leading his family members to salvation. It's not just his mother. He was leading all of his other cousins, siblings, and et cetera. And then Brother Roger, he just told me, we've been praying the family for years. He was getting some testimonies of people finally somewhere at the Philippines asking for materials. Amen. Now, isn't that a miracle? Now, look at the heart and the core of God's working. And you notice Satan was going like this in your life. You notice how Satan was attacking and throwing thunder in your life. You know why? He, it was at the core. It's at the very heart when God is about to bring something miraculous and mighty in your life. And Satan sees that. You know why? He's smarter than you. You're dumber than him. Satan can predict he's not omniscient like God but he can see God's plan better than you can and when you don't see the plan of God Satan sees that and then he'll start attacking and he'll start attacking right when God is about to bring something down the core of filth that's where sin strikes at the heart of the matter at the core of the matter you don't want to create the ditch that will be at the core and the center of God's work my sixth point is the convenience of filth. The convenience of filth. This one's a really good point right here. Now look at verse 7. And it was so when they came into the midst of the city that Ishmael, the son of Nathaniah, slew them and cast them into the midst of the pit, he and the men that were with him. Look at verse 9. Now the pit wherein Ishmael had cast all the dead bodies of the men whom he had slain because of Gadaliah was it which Asa the king had made for fear of Baasha king of Israel. And Ishmael the son of Nathaniah filled it with them that were slain. Now you see that? After Ishmael killed the Jews, guess what? He would have left it like that. But someone built the ditch for him. That was King Asa. He saw the ditch. So then Ishmael, he found a convenience where he can just dump all the bodies at. See, when you are a filthy ditch, you know what you become? You become a convenience for the wicked to use for evil purposes. Mm, that's good. Okay. This point is going to strike your heart. Didn't you know that your sin and your life, that your ditch is going to remain that chess piece for the world, the flesh, and the devil to use for their own convenience? You, were, you always resisted the flesh, the world, and the devil. You were not pliable. You refused to budge because you were stubborn and strong and you were obstinate and hard like a flint in the word of God. But now that you let the flesh and the world and the devil keep bending you and breaking you and shaking you, shaking you, now you became more pliable and pliable. And once you give in and build the ditch, now you became their convenience to use for evil purposes. You became the convenience to use for atheists to always talk about in news reports. So many people don't go to church anymore. These are the statistics. Why? Because of Christians who became the ditch to not come to church. Now they became a convenient tool for atheists to brag about. Look at our numbers. We're growing. We're growing over a billion now. Look at the Christianity. A lot of them are turning to atheism now. You know why? Building a filthy ditch. Building a filthy ditch. Now you became a convenience, a convenient tool for the devil to use. Now that you've gone off into wrong doctrine where you're getting into anti-Semitism, where Israel is no longer God's chosen people, and where you're going out that we're going to go through the tribulation and fight the government, and you become like a jerk and a bad testimony, and you get yourself tased at the border, and you say you, and you street preach all kinds of nonsense, yeah, shock on. words and shock yeah, tactics yeah, and street those. preaching, so that you can like gather up a crowd and start up a fight. You deliberately pick fights, and then you say homosexuals 
angels can never be saved. They're gonna burn in hell. I'm glad that they got killed. And these people are supposedly King James only, independent, fundamental Baptist churches. How much of a convenient tool have they been used by the devil, the world, and the flesh to publicize what independent, fundamental Baptist, King James only churches stand for? Shame on you. You Amen. became the wretched and a wicked, wicked ditch. Shame on you. Now you became the convenience for the wicked to use. Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 10 through 12, it says, My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. If they say, Come with us, let us lay wait for blood. Let us lurk privately for the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them up alive as the grave and whole as those that go down into the pit. See that now the wicked are able to use this pit. A pit is now a convenience tool for the wicked. Your sin, your testimony, what you do in creating a ditch is a convenience for the devil to use, you gotta understand. My seventh point is the compromise of filth. <clears throat> Look at verse eight, verse eight. The compromise of filth. But 10 men were found among them that said unto Ishmael, slay us not, for we have treasures in the field of wheat and of barley and of oil and of honey. So he forbear and slew them not among their brethren. So you'll notice right here that at verse eight, that these people compromise with Ishmael so that they don't fall into the ditch. Now, you know what happens when you become a filthy ditch? When there are Christians hanging by the threads and they don't wanna fall into the ditch with you and they wanna hang on to what's right, they're still gonna sin because they're gonna compromise. They are gonna compromise whatever it, it takes so that they don't fall into the ditch. And you gotta realize this, when there are so many Christian churches that are not closed down yet and they did not shut off yet. You know why? Because 90%, if not 95% of the pastors have compromised. Right. They have compromised so that they don't preach a negative sermon like this one. I mean, I don't think they're gonna preach a sermon like this. This is like really hard stuff right here. I might lose people after this, Come but on. here's the point. The Amen. point is, is that when Great. pastors wanna keep the membership and the people, that's, right. that's why they will use silky, honeyed, smooth, buttered up words that's like right. poetry yep. and smile 24 seven with a good looking complexion to keep the members in. That's why they will retain the worldly music. Yeah. That's that's why they will retain interdenominational doctrines. It doesn't really matter. Multiple different Bibles. It doesn't really matter. That's why they will store up gimmick after gimmick That's right. to bribe the people into church. That's why they will try to please the people, you know, and then pat the back of their hand, you know, in case something bad has happened in their life and try to flatter them. And when it comes to something wrong doctrine or sin, they try to change the subject so that they can and talk nice about them. You know, I know how pastors are. I've been a pastor for a while, all right? It's always politicking, politicking. You see, that's what pastors do. They compromise so that they don't fall into a ditch. And you got to realize when you've fallen into a ditch and your brother and sister in Christ is trying not to fall into the ditch with you, they can only save themselves by compromising. Because so many people can't take hard preaching anymore and they run away. The remaining members and the pastors, they can only retain their Christianity and their church by compromising. Do you want to be that kind of person? Do you want to be the type of person that will cause your fellow brother, sister in Christ to compromise into what is wrong? In Genesis chapter 37, we won't turn there for time's sake, but you can write this down and look it up yourself if you want in your own time. It's Genesis 37, verse 17 through 22. Genesis 37 verses 17 through 22. But in that passage, when you read it, it talks about Joseph's brothers. And Joseph's brothers, they wanted to kill Joseph in a pit. But you know, Reuben, was, Reuben the oldest brother, was not a part of that. But you know what Reuben did? Even though Reuben was not a part of it in killing Joseph, 
He didn't defend Joseph in front of them. You know what he did? He was compromising with them on how to punish Joseph. Then chapter 42, verses 22, and if you read backwards into verse 21, which we won't turn to, but Genesis chapter 42, verse 22, and then you go backwards to verse 21, you're going to find out this. Reuben was not part of the group who wanted to kill Joseph. But you know what happened? When you read that passage, Joseph, he got, he became the second ruler in charge of all Egypt. And his brothers, they didn't recognize who Joseph was, and they came to him. And Joseph, he punished his brothers, <laughs> especially with all the with all the evil that his brothers did against him. Reuben, he joined in the punishment with the brothers. Even though he wasn't part of the, the group That's who good. wanted to kill Joseph, but he was still punished with them. And you know what Reuben said? Reuben realized that he himself was also responsible yeah. for the sin that was committed against Joseph. That's what he says. Reuben said, did not I tell you not to do this? Christians acting like filthy dish, ditches should learn the lesson that their sin will cause some laborers who don't want to sin like you, who don't want to fall into the ditch like you. Laborers whose heart are right with God, like Reuben, like trying to maintain at least the purity, you're going to cause them to compromise. You know why Pastor Gene Kim will compromise one day if you find him doing that five years later? Because he can't take it anymore. And then he's going to have to compromise so that he can get more money for his salary, increase the ties, get a nice God building, God. get more people inside. And then you'll hear Pastor Gene Kim one day now preaching nice stuff and avoiding certain doctrines that will cause controversy. Why? Because to build a bigger church so that he can survive in his life as a minister. When you see that one day, you will know why. Because there were people building filthy ditches and the pastor can only do so much not to join them in the ditch by compromising and doing what's wrong. That's good. You don't want to do that to your fellow brother and sister in Christ. So you'll see me pound really hard on preachers preaching wrong doctrine. Yeah, because they are responsible for the sheep. But I also, I also understand their position. You know why? Once they switch to the King James Bible only issue, once they switch to dispensational truth and all of its doctrines, then you lose everything. My eighth point is the cowardice of filth. The cowardice of filth. When you build a ditch, it's cowardice, you got to realize. Look at verse 9. Now the pit wherein Ishmael had cast all the dead bodies of the men whom he had slain because of Gedaliah was it which Asa the king had made for fear of Baasha, king of Israel. So notice that the ditch was made because of fear, because of cowardice. The real reason of making the ditch in your life, you got to understand, is because somebody feared. You didn't fear God. You feared on the wrong things. You know why you built a ditch? You're, you don't fear God. You don't fear God. You fear something else. You fear how you look in front of your family members and friends and loved ones. You, you're afraid of how you would appear when you knock on the door, when you preach on the streets. You're afraid of how weird you would look when you don't drink, when you're not the only one drinking in a big family event. You are afraid on how holier than thou and all these weird religious things that you're saying out of your mouth and then people will look at you funny. You're afraid that you will never be able to enjoy that pleasure of sin that your fleshy memory is recalling. You're afraid, you're afraid of selling out to Jesus Christ and facing persecution yeah, yeah, for his name. Yeah, You're good. afraid of sacrificing something that you love and that is precious in your life. That's why you built the ditch. The ditch is because you fear. And it's not God. It's on the wrong things. <clears throat> but see, it doesn't matter what you fear in this life. Can anything be worse than the fear of the Lord? Can anything be more scary than how God judges your life? It doesn't matter what it is. The lack of pleasure in your life, is that greater than the fear of the Lord? 
the terror of the Lord at the judgment seat of Christ. Stress from busyness. Does that, is that more scary than the fear of the Lord and the terror of the Lord at the judgment seat of Christ? The uncomfortableness of yourself. Is that more scary than the fear of the Lord in your life? Your own self-image rather than thinking about others. Is that more scary to retain your self-image, how you look, rather than humbling yourself and thinking about others more than the fear of the Lord and the terror of the Lord at the judgment seat of Christ? What's more scary than that? Isaiah 24, 18 reads, And it shall come to pass that he who fleeth from the noise of the fear shall fall into the pit. See, you know why you fall into the pit and the ditch? Fear. It doesn't matter how much you're afraid of, well, I'm afraid to do this for the Lord. I'm afraid that this is going to happen. Oh, I don't want to do this. I'm afraid of this and that. Guess what? When you're afraid and you run away, you're going to fall into the ditch. My final point and my ninth point, the carrying of filth. The carrying of filth. Look at verse 10. Verse 10. This is sad. Then Ishmael carried away, notice, captive, all the residue of the people that were in Mizpah. Even the king's daughters and all the people that remained in Mizpah, etc., etc. See, the entire calamity of that filthy ditch, it did not end there. The remainder of the people who were not killed and thrown into the ditch, they were carried off into slavery. And so you got to understand this, the calamity of a filthy ditch not only kills some brethren, your ditch does not just affect some people around the room. It will also hurt the leftovers who have not been affected by your ditch. Didn't you know that? You got to realize overall as a whole, it affects the whole world. Think about it. If you had every Christian living right for Jesus Christ and winning souls, shouldn't the whole world be converted by now? It affects the whole world, not just the people around you, the whole world. He's Exodus chapter 21, verse 33 and 34, it reads, And if a man shall open a pit, or if a man shall dig a pit, and not cover it, guess what? And an ox or an ass fall therein, the owner of the pit shall make it good, and give money unto the owner of them, and the dead beast shall be his. See, when a man dug a filthy ditch and killed the ox, that action not only hurt the ox, but the owner as well, who didn't get hurt by the pit at all. Why? Because the owner lost his income. The owner lost his food, his source of income, the ox. So even though the owner was not affected by the ditch, he wasn't the one hurt by the ditch, it was the ox, it still nevertheless affected him. And you've got to realize this, see, You've got to realize that directly, when the ditch you dig, it directly affects you, and it directly affects other people around you. But indirectly, it affects all the other leftovers. There may be some Christians who are faithfully serving God. They're hanging in there. Man, look at Pastor Kim. He's still going and then preaching for the Lord and stuff like that. And they're not affected by the ditch. But guess what? They still feel some sort of hurt by something that you did with the ditch. It never changes that fact. It may have not directly hurt of them, but guess what? Humans have emotions, and humans feel hurt, and they will feel hurt somewhere. Let's close it right here with 2 Chronicles. Please turn to 2 Chronicles 16. 2 Chronicles chapter 16. And let's close the whole service with this. 2 Chronicles chapter 16. And we will read verse 7. Verse 7. Second Chronicles chapter 16. And we will read verse 7. What you're going to find out is that it all comes down to the heart. That's why the Lord mentioned the heart. The heart is the whole issue. And he didn't give all these legalistic rules in every detail. Because what changes everything is the heart. You've got to realize. If Asa's heart was right with God to begin with he would not have made that filthy ditch to begin with. And then Ishmael would not have used that ditch for his convenience 
to slaughter the people. See, Christians, if your heart was right with God to begin with, guess what? You would not have become a filthy ditch at all. All of us are imperfect. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But I guarantee you this. If your heart is right with God first, then that filthy ditch would not have been the result. But see, you consistently justified your sins. You consistently made excuses. You didn't think about others. You only thought about yourself. You didn't seriously check your heart at everything that whatever you did may have burdened the church. And because you haven't done that, you got to realize that, see, it all came out from the heart to begin with. Now let's look at this passage, 2 Chronicles 16, verse 7. And at that time, Hanani the seer came to Asa, king of Judah, right? The guy, the person who did the ditch. And said unto him, Because thou hast relied on the king of Syria and not relied on the Lord thy God. See, it all started there, his heart. Therefore is the host of the king of Assyria escaped out of thine hand. Were not the Ethiopians and the Lubims a huge host with very many chariots and horsemen? Yet because thou didst rely on the Lord, he delivered them into thine hand. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of when does he intercede? When does God intercede so that you don't have to rely on your flesh and build a ditch for your convenience in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him? Herein thou hast done foolishly. Therefore from henceforth thou shalt have wars. What did King Asa do when he heard this particular sermon that you're hearing? You're responsible for building the ditch, Asa. Get your heart right with God. It's all about your heart. Will you settle everything in your heart now with God? What did Asa respond? I wonder if this is you. Look at verse 10. Verse 10. Then Asa was wroth with the seer and put him in a prison house, for he was in a rage with him because of this thing, and Asa oppressed some of the people at the same time. Sadly, the majority of Christians, the more majority of people, perhaps you who are listening, will react like this. The prophet of God warned you. You built a filthy ditch. You built a filthy ditch, and the whole heart of the matter is your heart. Get that right with God. Quickly. Will you be like Asa and cast the preacher into prison? Cast the preaching of the word of God into prison. Cast away the Lord and say, I don't want to hear you anymore, God. And throw them in prison. And condemn and criticize. And then, you know, uh, just ruin the preaching of the word of God and say, I don't like that. And that was bad. And, you know, uh, I can't understand it. And then guess what? Now you're going to become like many of those sad and unfortunate and bitter Christians who left church who became atheists. Who said, yeah, I had a pastor who talked like that and preached like that. And because of that, I didn't like that anymore. You're going to end up like that. You know why? Casting the prophet of God and the preaching into prison. Will that be you today? Is that your response? Every head bow and every eye shut. The altar call is open. Get out of your ditch. Get out of your ditch. For some of you who are unfamiliar with this, this is a time that we give to you where you can pray to the Lord yourself. And if the preaching touched your heart in any way, you can get that right with God. If there's something you want to thank the Lord for in this preaching, you can thank the Lord. This is your own time with God. If the Holy Spirit led, led upon your heart, don't let that hinder you. Feel free to come down here on the altar's floor like some of these people are doing. If the Holy Spirit led that upon your heart, you know, don't. Uh, quench the spirit. Feel free to come. If you want to pray in your seat too, that's fine. However the Holy Spirit leads in your heart, just don't let him hinder. Will you cover up that ditch? Will you stop being a filthy ditch? Will you give your life to Jesus Christ? Some of you got to realize this. <clears throat> There's a greater pit there's a far deeper ditch, and that's a burning hell. Didn't you know that if you die today, that because of your sin, you will burn in hell forever after you die? You might say, seriously, preacher? Yeah. 
Everyone sinned. Sin is any bad thing you've done. And let's be honest, everybody sinned. You've sinned. You've got to realize this. If you died right now, this is not popular to say, but you need to hear this so you can get saved. If you died right now, you'd burn in hell forever because of your sin. You might say, man, preacher, I don't want to burn in hell forever for my sin. Guess what? You can get saved today. You can get saved right now. You might say, well, preacher, how do I get saved? Jesus, who is God, he left heaven, came down here on earth, and he died on the cross, buried, and resurrected. Do you know why Jesus went through that bloody mess for you? So his blood can come out and wash away all the sins that you've done. That's why. That's how God can get rid of your sins and save you, is by his blood. You see that? So if you want to be saved from hell, <clears throat> you need to trust. You need to believe only in the blood to save you. So all you have to do to get saved is this. It's so simple. All you have to do to get saved is 15 seconds or less, just say to God, just say to God, God, I'm sorry for my sins. I know I'm going to hell for my sins. I'm sorry. So I'm only going to trust. I'm only going to believe in the blood you shed on the cross to save me. That's it. That's all it takes to get saved. Don't trust in your good works. Don't think that, well, I'll quit this sin. I'll clean up my life. I'll stop sinning. No, that doesn't get you saved. Getting baptized doesn't get you saved. Going to church doesn't get you saved. Don't trust in anything you do. See that? Trust only in the blood of Jesus. That's what saves your soul. Do you want to get saved right now? You might say, well, preacher, uh, if I were to die right now, I'm not 100% certain I would go to heaven after I die. So I want to get saved right now from hell. Can you help me? Sure, I'll help you out. So all you have to do is say it to God. If you don't know how to say it to God, I'll even give you the words. I'll give you the words on how to say it, and all you have to do is repeat after me. Now, with every head bow and every eye shut, no one knows who you are, and I'm not going to point you out. So this is totally private, okay? So don't feel embarrassed or ashamed. No one's going to point you out, okay? So I'm going to give you the words how to say it, and all you have to do is just repeat after me. Uh, you don't have to say it out loud. Just say it, say it silently to yourself. You can say it silently to yourself. So don't worry. We're not going to point you out. No one knows who you are, okay? So all you have to do is say to God you trust in the blood. If you don't know how to say it, I'll give you the words. Repeat after me, and you don't have to say it out loud. Dear God, I repent as a sinner, and I'm only trusting in the blood of Jesus to save me. I believe Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected so his blood can wash away my sins. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen. Amen. If you would bow your head and close your eyes just one last time, please, just one last time, and no one looking around. This is out of respect for the person, all right, to not feel ashamed and, and embarrassed, okay? So this is just out of respect for them, please. All right. <clears throat> if this was, your, if this was uh, your time where you said, Preacher, I just repeated those words after you, and I just got saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, could you just slip up your hand real quickly, real briefly? I'm not going to point out who you are, and no one knows who you are. Every head is bowed and every eye is shut. Uh, could you just slip up your hand real briefly right now, please? That way I can know that somebody did get saved. Could you just slip up real quickly and put it down? That's it. All right. Thank you. Thank you for your honesty. Let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the blood, and that's how we get saved. Thank you so much that we're saved from the pit of hell, Lord. And dear Lord God, I pray that we will be saved from the pit of everyday sin today in our lives. I pray that the Christians today will live holy and clean so that they don't fall into the pit of everyday sin. You've saved us from the pit of hell, Lord, forever. But I pray, dear Lord God, now that we're saved Christians, we won't fall into the pit of sin. We won't fall into everyday pits that we fall into and hurt people around us and hurt our own lives and most of all hurt you. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Out of all the wrong doctrines that's happening in our day and age at the last days of the church, as the apocalypse is coming even closer, the point of all this, friend, is that you won't be even able to grow in knowledge of the truth, in Bible-believing truth, until you get saved first. The most important question you have to ask yourself after watching all this is if you were to die today, are you 100% sure that you're going to go to heaven? Perhaps one of these wrong doctrines have affected you and you had the improper way of salvation. As you have seen before, the way to get saved is very simple. It's only simply salvation by grace alone, without works, through the Lord Jesus Christ in this Christian day and age. If you're not sure that you can go to heaven after you die, it's very simple to get saved. First of all, you have to understand that because of sin, God is a holy God, and He cannot even allow 1% of sin into heaven. So He has to judge sin with a burning hell. So it is very important that you got to realize how serious sin is, and you must repent. You might say, well then, I guess I have to clean up all my sins. I guess I have to go to church. I guess I have to get baptized. I have to, I have to be a good person. No, my friend, good works can never save you. Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected so that he can pay all the sins for you. You don't have to pay a single sin for yourself. So all you have to do as a repentant sinner is turn to what he did on the cross alone for your salvation. You might say, well, pastor, I do believe only on what Jesus did on the cross to save me. That's great. Then all you have to do is just say that to the Lord. You might say, well, preacher, I haven't prayed much before in my life. I don't know really how to say it to God. Can you help me out? Sure, you can say it this way. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. As I repent, I put my faith that Jesus is God and that he died, buried and resurrected so that his blood can wash away my sins. I put my faith in that alone to save me, not my good works. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Congratulations, my friend, if you meant it with all your heart that you put your faith only on what Jesus did on the cross through his blood to save you, then you are saved. It's that simple, my friend. Now, my friend, it is important to grow in Bible-believing truth. You now know the truth. What are you going to do about it? As the apocalypse comes even more closer and Satan's about his, to set up his kingdom even more, there are many souls dying and going to hell, and even many more churches out there who don't know right and wrong doctrine. It is up to you now on what to do. And go to our resources site, www.bbcenglish.org, and click on the resources link over there, and it'll give you everything that you need to grow in grace. The next step of your journey now is up to you. We've done our part giving you this movie. All of it was done for free by the love of the people. God bless you.